Good morning, church family. Welcome. How is everybody? Good. Good morning to all of those of you who are watching online also. And if you're new and visiting us, welcome. Our scripture reading today is from Psalm 103 and verses 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. Amen. If you notice, we have a bunch of those youths up here with us today. We've got our youth band. Um, Along with a couple dads, I don't know, I guess we had to throw a couple dads in the mix too, so David over there, myself. Um, but God has been doing some really cool things with our, especially our, our young ladies. Um, by the way, we need some young men up here too, so, you know, if you know any of those sorts of people, send them my way. Um, I'll teach them how to play guitar and then they'll be cool. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but we're going to sing worship today and, and uh, we're just excited to lead you guys and, and to worship together as the body of Christ, young and old, Amen. So let's rise together, and uh, we're going to sing about how the Lord has victoriously conquered the grave, and he's let us run out of that grave too, all right? I was buried. Call my name 
man, percussion led by junior high girls. Come on. Come on, y'all. Uh, it's so good. So good to see the whole body, the whole family together. If you don't got a name tag, go get a name tag. During our greeting time, not right now. Let's get it later. But, uh, let's, let's continue to worship the Lord. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Amen. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone. Higher than my sight. High above my life. I will trust in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow who you love, I'll love, how you serve, I'll serve. In this life I lose, I will follow you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, and, and uh, yeah, dads for that. <laughs> Praise God for that. Why don't you turn around to each other and give each other a warm greeting this morning? And you can do it by name because you have name tags.
Good morning, everybody. Let's try that again. I'm going to say good morning, and you'll all respond good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's beautiful. Wonderful. <laughs> so good to see all of you out there this morning. We enjoy coming and being together as a family. We want to worship the Lord, and we want to have fellowship together as the family of Christ. We have a number of announcements, so please, I, I trust you listen to them. We have connection card in front again. We do get them. We do respond to them. If you have a message for us, you'd like us to do something, a question, a prayer request, please feel free to fill out that connection card that's in the pew rack in front of you. As you can see, many people are wearing a name tag today. How about that? We, yeah, go ahead. Get, give a clap. <laughs> we know who we are, and that's very, that's very important. Now, we're only going to do this once a month. So when you see a name, what do you mean to do? Memorize it. No. <laughs> so, but, and we do ask you to do something after the service. Would you kindly put the plastic container back on the table so we can use them all of the time? We deeply appreciate that. And it does save on the cost. Also, this coming Tuesday, what do we have? Harvest, Harvest Fest. And this is going to be a wonderful time together with we as a church family. Reach out to our community around us. We have a, I'm going to use a big word, a plethora. We have many, we have many things <laughs> happening on Tuesday. And so we trust that you'll come and join with us. If you have signed up to help serve, we need you to look at the table in the patio afterwards so that you can see what time you will be having your, your, your part. Also, we have Operation Christmas Child, the Christmas boxes. We uh, fill these boxes with wonderful things, and then Samaritan's Purse makes sure that they get literally around the world to children who have probably never heard of Jesus Christ before, and it's an opportunity for us and for others to share Jesus with them. And ladies, that's due November the 12th, and then ladies, in the way of a service opportunity, you have the privilege of packing these boxes on November the 4th at 1 p.m. So ladies, just know this is an opportunity for you to come to serve and to fellowship together. And men, we have an awesome time on November the 18th at 8.30 at meeting here at the church. At the church, Jared, where are you? Are we meeting uh, no. at the school? Torrance High School, 8.30, wear your, wear your work clothes, your coveralls, whatever you don't mind getting dirty in, and we're going to have a great time serving the Lord by helping Torrance High School, so that is on November the 18th, and then Mission Sunday, we have November the 12th, we have about five or six of our missionaries coming to join with us, Bobby Gupta from India is going to be sharing in the morning service, and we're going to have a wonderful time, and then on November the 19th, my goodness, our Thanksgiving potluck. So many, many things getting ready to go on. So know these things. Join with us. Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive dominion and power and glory and honor and praise. And the choir is going to sing that song. Worship with us as we sing.
Well, our theme this morning is, is the family from Ephesians, and we're going to be going through that in our scripture soon. So let's sing a couple of songs about that, starting with number 451, A Christian Home. We'll sing the first two stanzas. Let's stand as we sing. If you're turning your hymnals, two more is number 453. Happy our home was when God is there. Let's sing stanzas one, two, and four.
God, we, we agree and resonate with the lyrics of this song. We humbly ask that you would come and fill our lives with your presence. For you alone, O oh Lord, are worthy of our reverence and our honor and our worship and our praise. Thank you, Father, for our families. And we ask now that you would speak to us through your word in this passage in Ephesians as you teach us how to live for you and your glory and to serve you as husbands and wives, fathers and mothers and children. Bless our families. In this time in your word, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, what a beautiful morning of, of music and worship and praise we have had so far today. You know, that, that last song, um, I don't know if you noticed, I got a little choked up. And I didn't think I was going to get this way. Dang it. <laughs> uh, Ron, it's your fault. No, um, we had a choir director at our old church by the name of Bob Shepard. And every time I hear that song, Bob's face is in my mind. Um, whew. Went on to be with Jesus quite a few years ago. Taught me so much about music. Taught me so much about how to praise the Lord with all that I am. Had his legs amputated and he just sang even louder. Like, and just with more gusto and more heart and more fervor. He actually sang at my wife and I's wedding. Um, which was amazing. So anyway, <laughs> again, like we learned last week, there's something about music, right? There's, it touches our souls. It touches our hearts. It, it draws us into a place um, where we can worship the Lord, where we can um, just, I don't know. There's something about it. I can't, I, words don't even describe it for me. There's also something about God's word. Um, God's word is living and it's active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces between our, our, our bones and our marrow, our, our soul and our spirit. Um, it's just an amazing opportunity that you and I have to study the very words of God. Think, think about that. When we think about studying God's word, we're studying the words of God. It's declared by his lips. And so what should we do? We should listen right? We should hear. We should do then what it says, because he is good to us. All right, so let me shift gears a little bit for this week. Mewage, that blessed arrangement that brings us together today to love. Some of you are laughing. Some of you are like, I have no idea what he's doing right now. Is he making fun of somebody? No, it's from a movie, Princess Bride. But anyways, we're talking about uh, marriage today. And no, this is not a wedding ceremony. And some of you are thinking, why am I here then? Um, but we are talking about marriage today because we're talking about the issue of husband and wife. And, and, and the Lord, through his servant Paul, addresses today this idea of submission in the family. First and foremost, it's submission within the relationship between husband and wife, but then also later on, the relationship between children and their parents. Um, and we're going to look at what that looks like. Last week, we finished our three weeks of walking. Boy, are my legs tired. Oh, come on. I'll hear, booze are fine. Yeah, give me some booze. If you're just deadpan, I'm like, oh, oh wow, that's not good. Um, the, our three, la three weeks of walking with a the theme of walking in wisdom. You see, we walk in wisdom when we redeem the time and we know and understand his will. When we are filled by the Spirit rather than other things. When we are able to sing and give thanks and submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And this week, that final clause of submitting to one another will be fleshed out in the context, like I said, of family relationships between husbands and wives and of parents and children. Now, this really could be two separate weeks, and the last section, well, actually, it probably will spill over into next week just because of our time today, which is fine. God is good, right? Um, so today we're probably mostly going to deal with the idea, with the issue of marriage uh, between husband and wife. Um, but first, let me remind us of Ephesians 5.21. So if you'll turn with me there to Ephesians 5.21. 
And we'll just read that verse to start our time together. It says simply this, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And if you remember last week, I said that's hard for any of us to do. We don't want to submit to anyone, right? We live in a world in which submission is not a good word in our vocabulary. It's a bad word because it means that we can't get ahead in life. It means that we, we have nothing in life, right? We have to step all over people in order to get where we need to go, right? No, you're right. That's not the way the world should um, work. It should work with uh, good relationships and mutual submission one to another. We learn that the spirit-filled person submits to the other out of a reverence for Christ. And it's that last phrase which gives much insight into what this submission entails. We do it not because of anything within us, but out of submission and reverence for Christ, It's because he has called us to that, right? It's Christ who gave the ultimate example of submission. You know the, the Christ hymn of Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8, it says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And when we start to grumble about what it means to submit to one another, to, to love each other that we're, the way we're supposed to, we ought to always look to the example of Christ, right? Because he had it all. He had everything. The world was his. The universe was his. All authority, dominion, and power were his. And it says he gave it up. To do what? To become like you and me. Yikes. Who in their right mind would want to do that? (laughs) Only a God who loves us. Only a God who realized that the way to save his wayward people was to become one of us, to enter into our human experience and suffer and die so that we might live because of the power of his resurrected life. Amen and amen. And so submission is not something we take lightly. It's not something that we need to throw away. It's very easy to look at this, and i got to explain this whole thing away, right? Submission, that's not a word we use, but that's not what God's Word says. Okay, so before we get into the specifics then of submission of wives and husbands and the love of husbands to their wives, I want to mention two schools of thought regarding this relationship. Um, And I'm just going to mention them. I'm not going to talk too much about them. I'm going to define them, and then we're going to stop there, and I'm going to let the Word speak to you, okay? So first is complementarianism. Uh, Complementarianism is the view that within the relationship between a husband and wife, there is a hierarchy. The husband is supposed to be the spiritual head of the household, of course, with Christ as his head, and with the wife then feeling a submissive yet complementary role. That's complementarianism, okay, in a nutshell, very briefly. We can go all day on that. The second one is egalitarianism. Now, egalitarianism is the view that marriage relationship is a relationship of equals who mutually submit to one another with either no one or one or the other taking that sort of headship role in life's decisions. And that's based on the idea that everyone is equal under Christ, okay? Um, These deal with larger categories of life in the church, including uh, ministry areas and things like that. But today we're going to stick, like I said, with the home. And rather than get into all the nuances of each this morning, we're going to let the text speak for itself. Perhaps by the time we're done, if you haven't made up your mind yet, one way or the other, you will be ready to decide. But if not, that's okay as well. This is something that the church, and I would say true believers in Christ throughout, and I know we have some in this room who are on both sides of that spectrum, and that's okay, right? Um, But the most time is spent on the relationship between husband and wife in this passage as well. Uh, Kids and and parents get like four verses, and and, uh, uh, servants and their masters get a few verses, but it's husband and wife that get a big section. And you might have often heard it uh, quoted at weddings and things like that because it's one of those important key passages. So without further ado, let's look at what the Word has to say. Um, 
It says this, wives, verse 22, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body. And it is, and is himself its savior. And now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, and he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And this mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband." I want us to notice that, once again, out of all the relationships in this passage, most time is spent upon this. And notice the difference in content and time spent between wives and husbands. We'll talk about that in a second, too. For some more context, we might even look at some familiar passages in Colossians 3, 18 through 19, which says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord, and husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. I know my wife likes that one, right? Um, 1 Peter 3, 1 through 2 and verse 7 says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. All right, so let's begin with the better half, All right? Of course, it would be our wives. Now, again, if you are single, I have a word for you later. If you are, if you are or have been divorced, I have a word for you as well. But for right now, I'm speaking specifically to wives or those who hope to one day be a wife, All right. Um, It says this, according to Paul, it says wives are supposed to submit to their own husbands, own husbands, as to the Lord. This does not mean that a woman must submit to any man, it says, to her own husband. Nor is it the same as how a child is to obey his or her parents. In fact, and I'm sorry, kids, the word obey is only used for children and servants, okay, which... Might be the same thing. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) We'll talk more about that next week. But anyways, um, sorry. To obey is only used for that. But in in no way does submission make a woman inferior to a man. I want to start by saying that right here and right now. It does not mean that women are inferior to men. In fact, in many ways, I think they are quite superior. Amen. (laughs) All right. Um, but it is quite clear elsewhere in Scripture that men and women, like I said, are equal, and we all bear the image of God, and we are all heirs of the promise of salvation. So what is it then? We can't just push it away, kick it to the curb, say it doesn't mean anything, say it's solely cultural or contextual, because I don't think so, because it's spread out throughout many passages in Scripture, so it has to be a little bit deeper of an understanding than just that. So what is it? Well, friends, it's a matter of function, of functionality and of order. Patsia said the need for order lies behind all the instruction that encompasses this domestic code. You see, it says, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. We, as the church, are to submit to who? Christ, the headship of Christ, right? In the same way, it says, the wife is to submit to the headship of her husband, to follow his lead. Wearsby said, headship, though, is not dictatorship, okay? Headship, sadly, and I want to say this, and this is the issue I think that a lot of people have with this term. It's because headship has received such negative press because, let's face it, most of us men have no idea what it means to be the head of our families. 
we often fall short. First one to admit that I fall short of being the head of my family. We either gravitate to one of the extremes. Either we become a dictator, like Wearsby said, or we are so emasculated due to indifference, fear, societal constructs, or whatever factor there may be. You see, friends, neither is the truth. The truth is in the middle. The truth says we take that headship role because that's a picture of what Christ is in the church. We'll talk about that in a second as well. And it makes things function. I already mentioned that submission in no way makes the wife inferior to the husband. It also doesn't mean that the wife needs to do all the cooking and cleaning and all that kind of stuff, right? Unless, of course, that's what functions best within your relationship and your family. And Because I'll, I'll say this. For example, when Amy and I first got married, I ended up doing most of the cooking. And why was that? Because she worked longer hours than I did and got home later. And so in order for me to fill this belly, I had to cook. <laughs> but it was a mutual decision that we made because at that point in time, that's what our relationship looked like. It didn't mean that she was any less, quote unquote, submissive to me and I wasn't still her head. We decided upon that. Now, as time went on and we decided we're going to have a family, or should I say God decided we're going to have a family, and the oldest child who's now in college came, yes, I'm that old now, um, she, when, when she came, we decided, okay, now's the time. No more working for Miss Amy, and she's going to stay at home, and she's going to raise our kids, and I'm going to you know, be the, the, the sole breadwinner, basically, for our family. Boy, talk about a sacrifice. Our family made a sacrifice, but because we knew that that job was so important for her. And we'll talk again a little bit more about that next week between you know, fathers and mothers and, and their kids. But anyway, so that was the decision that we made. And for function's sake, now she does most of the cooking, similarly with the cleaning. I mean, I do the dishes, and she does just about everything else. So, but again, we, it's, it's a, a mutual kind of thing. Now, what about this, though? What do we do if the wife has no desire to submit to her husband? Or what do you do when the husband does not behave like he's supposed to and is not worthy of submission? Remember that first Peter verse that I read where he talked about how the wife, by submitting to her husband, might actually win her husband? Maybe that comes into play here, right? But what if, what if this happens? What if the man shirks his responsibility, his God-given responsibility of being the head of the household, especially if the man is abusive towards the woman. And I know and I understand that there are many in this room who have faced that before. And so I don't want to make light of this as well. So what do we do? Well, we come back to the principle mentioned in verse 21 and at the end of verse 22. The wife is to submit out of reverence to Christ and as to the Lord, what Mitten said, and I love this, he said, we are not asked to yield to the wishes of others no matter what they wish, but only when they ask of us, when what they ask of us is in line with reverence for Christ, okay? And that has application across the board. If your boss asks you to do something unethical, are you going to do what he says? No, you're going to risk being fired, and that's okay, okay? But we don't want to compromise our beliefs. Refusal, though, to submit just because we don't want to, that's not biblical either. Okay? So, again, lots to parse through, and uh, God is good. So, I want to move, though, now from the three verses that deal with how the wife is supposed to respond to her husband to the uh, nine verses that talk about the husband's responsibility. Hmm, I wonder why that is. I guess the Lord knows we need to hear the message three times as many, much as our wives do. All right, men, listen up. And I'm going to be real serious, and I'm preaching to myself here, y'all. But here, let's listen up, men. It says, note that husbands are not commanded to submit to, to their wives. It's a different calling. It's a different word there. They are commanded to love them, to love them. One might think that this lets the husband off the hook. Oh, 
Sweet, I don't have to submit. I get to control. I get to lead. I get to put my thumb over somebody. No, not true. What does it mean to love? One might think it gets us off the hook, but that's far from the case. The word he uses for love here is the word agape. It's what the ancients and my favorite C.S. Lewis called charity. It is selfless. It is self-sacrificial love. Patsy has said agape means to subordinate one's own interests, pleasures, and personality for the benefit of someone else. Now, of course, he doesn't mean we need to just be a little, you know, walking puppet. That's not what he's saying. And Paul actually ups the ante for husbands by saying that we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Now, how did Christ love the church? He died. He gave his life for her. Wow, okay, that's scary. I think I fail big time. (laughs) Thompson said the husband's love is to be based on the pattern of the self-giving love of Jesus, which he showed in becoming man, in serving human beings in his earthly life and in dying for them. I like that he mentions serving them even during life. Because you see, it's one thing to be willing to die for someone. Like if I see that my wife is going to step out into the street and a bus is barreling down, guess what I'm doing? I'm pushing her out of the way. I'm taking that hit for her, right? But to say that I live for her every day, that's where I fail. Miserably, in fact. Yes, your pastor admits he's a failure. Amen. God is good, though. God is good. Boyce gives a funny example. He says this, One wife rightly told her husband, Dear, I know that you're willing to die for me. You have told me that so many times. But while you're waiting to die, could you just fill in some of the time by helping me dry the dishes? (laughs) Now, in all seriousness, men, unless we ourselves understand the love of God in Christ, unless we are truly his followers, unless he has changed our hearts, we're going to be failures. We will never be able to love our, our lives the way that Christ loved the church. It's not in us. Then we have all this language regarding the purity of the church in verse 26 and 27, uh, Christ's role in sanctifying, washing and cleansing, making her without spot or wrinkle, holy and without blemish. And that is compared to what the the husband is supposed to do for the wife as well. And I love what Folk said. He said the husband is to love his wife not just because of the beauty he finds in her, but to make her even more beautiful. Now, how might this apply to the obligation then of the husband to love his wife? We are to seek and protect her purity. We are to lead her in her spiritual development. We are to, to, to wash her with the water of the word. Men, I think, again, this is where a few of us fall short. Husbands are to love their wives, as it says also, as their own bodies. Now, this is sort of weird, though. It sounds kind of narcissistic, if you will. I thought we're supposed to die to ourselves. Isn't that the whole definition of agape? But here it says to love one's wife is to love oneself, and that no one hates his own body, but nourishes it and cherishes it. Is he telling us men that we have to set the example and go get Manny Petties? No. It's where Paul sets the intent, right? He goes back to that original intent for marriage as it was given before the fall. Before the fall, friends. Genesis 2, 28 and 29, it's that one flesh union that he quotes here. For this reason, a man must leave his family, cleave only to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, that one flesh union. When questioned by the Pharisees on the issue of divorce in Matthew 19, Jesus does the same thing. He tells them, let's go back to the beginning. What was God's intent for this? Man and woman together in a lifelong commitment. Rather than allowing the Pharisees to keep finding loopholes in the law, you see, in loving his wife, a man is loving himself because she is one with him. They are one flesh. 
And that's what we dealt with two weeks ago when we talked about walking in purity. And clearly what Paul has in mind with all of those references, like I said, to the purity of the wife. And plus, this paints a picture, friends, of the relationship of Christ and his church. He nourishes us. He cherishes us because we are members, literally that word members, limbs. We are limbs of his body. We are an extension of that. And men, we ought to see our wives the same way. Would you chop your finger off? No, you care about it. You take care of it. Folks said the husband's position is head and his duty of sacrificial love and devoted care for his wife are but pictures. Imperfect, but the best that this life can offer of Christ as head and of his love, self-sacrifice, and concern for his church. And so then the dependence of the wife on her husband and her duty of submission are a picture of how the church then should live and act toward her divine Lord. You see, that's the mystery. It's about Christ and the church. But because you and I are members of him, we are called to reflect that. And what better way to reflect that than walking in obedience to his word? After Paul then waxes eloquently on this profound mystery of marriage as that type of relationship between Christ and the church, he comes once again to the original thrust of the section, the role of the husband and wife in marriage, reiterating that the husband is to love his wife as himself. And that the wife see that she respects her husband and that word respects means revere. Not fear. Not fear of punishment or anything like that, but revere and respect. Okay. Now, if we're still doubting this, may I share what Tom Wright said? He said, if this guideline still seems outrageous in today's culture... We should ask ourselves, do our modern societies in which marriage is often a tragedy or a joke really offer a better model of how to do it? Do they? See, we can't look to culture to define what our relationships ought to look like. We can't look to culture to to define the values within. We must look to the Lord and to His Word. Okay, so what about other situations? If I may pause for a moment before we move on to the relationship between parents and children, which actually will happen next week. I want to address the two categories I mentioned earlier, those who have been divorced and those who are single. For those who have been divorced, I realize that this subject is a difficult one. Of course, we know that God's intent and desire for marriage is what? Lifelong commitment. That's the intent, that's the desire. And perhaps the reason you were divorced is that one or both of the parties had been unfaithful. And according to Jesus, this is the exception clause. If reconciliation is impossible, his goal is always reconciliation in all things. Paul also allows for the abandonment of an unbeliever. But this isn't a sermon on divorce, so I'm not going to go any deeper into that. But what I will say is this. That God is in the business of reconciling. Let me say that one more time. God is in the business of reconciling and of changing hearts. Perhaps this might even apply to those who are struggling even right now in their marriage. And I know that there are some in this room. If there are or were patterns in your relationship that are or were unhealthy, those patterns can and must change. Ladies, if you struggle to follow the Lord's command to submit. And gents, if you struggle to love your wives as Christ loved the church, all is not lost because God is in the business of changing hearts and of reconciling. Through prayer, counsel, and accountability, reconciliation and thriving marriages are possible. They are possible. Now, for those of you that are single, This is for you. Let's say you're single and you have the desire to be married. What should you be doing now in this time? You should be allowing the Lord to mold you into the man or woman who one day will become the sort of husband or wife that God intends for us to be in marriage. For those who are single and have no desire for marriage, 
Hopefully, that isn't because you're scared to get married. Because you've seen so many unhappy and unhealthy marriages. In answer to this, Boyce said, part of the problem is that we live in a sinful world where nothing is perfect as we would like it. And marriage, by its very nature, opens us up to deep hurts. We are vulnerable in marriage, and therefore we are disappointed and hurt by its failures as we are not equally hurt by shortfalls in other relationships. Yes, married life can be hard. It's because we're sinful, but it can also be the most rewarding relationship. See, God called it good. In fact, he said it was not good for the man to be alone. And so he created a helper suitable for him. Genesis 2.18. And also we see in this passage that the marriage relationship is a picture of the relationship between Christ and his church. Something else that is beautiful, friends. So let's not allow the fallen nature of our world or our culture, which is in many ways anti-marriage, to stop us from experiencing something good. Now, for those of you who are single because you feel the Lord's call to celibacy, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 speaks a lot about this, and no, we're not going to go there because we'll really be here until next week. But it's clearly a biblical position, one which Paul desired, but notice he doesn't command it. He desires it. He said, I wish you were like me and able to stay single. But he says, I get it. Not everybody's like that. And two, remember, your singleness is for the kingdom of God. It's for undivided devotion to the Lord. And that, my friends, is a calling for you. So back to the question at the beginning. Complementarian, egalitarian, I hold to the former, but I recognize there's freedom therein. There are strong believers who are good friends who hold the latter. I think that this is one of those secondary level issues where we can have grace for one another in that. Whatever your view, be sure, though, that it is born of biblical fidelity. You get me? That it is born out of an understanding of God's word and not out of cultural expectations or cultural patterns. Okay? That's a hard one, because what I do care about are marriages. I do care about the gift of marriage itself. Friends, it is a sacred institution. It is a covenant entered into under God. God has called it good. It was ordained by God before the fall, has been redeemed by Christ after the fall. It is a picture of Christ and his church. Submission then and love then are only truly possible when we surrender all to Jesus. And that's why our marriages often fail, because we don't surrender to Jesus. But that's why everything in life fails, because we don't surrender to Jesus. And so let's surrender to him in all things, in all things. If you are single, surrender to Christ all of your desires and all of your fears. Pray that he transforms you into a man or a woman who can fulfill his intent for marriage or pray that in your singleness you can be undivided for the kingdom of God. That's hard enough to do as it is. If you are married and you're enjoying marital bliss, continue to keep Christ at the center modeling his sacrificial love to those around you. If you are married and your marriage is on shaky ground and you fight and you argue 
No one seems to know who's in charge. No one seems to know what to do. No one seems to know anything. Surrender to Jesus. And watch as he changes ashes into beauty. Because what better testimony is there than a relationship that was broken that has now been made whole? Let's let the world see that in us, friends, instead of dysfunction and disunity and despair. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are good. We thank you that you love us deeply. We know in many ways we fall short of the glory of God because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Lord, we know that we need you in this time to bring reconciliation where reconciliation is needed to continue to speak truth into our lives, to help us understand what it means to be in relationship with you first and foremost, because I would venture to say that most dysfunction that happens in the horizontal, uh, because the vertical is dysfunctional too. Lord, you call us to love you and to love people, to love one another, to love each other. We need your help in that. I want us to just take a moment to be silent before the Lord right now. Perhaps there is some hurt. Perhaps there is some brokenness. Perhaps there is some forgiveness that needs to happen. Take a moment, just confess it to the Lord. Ask him to do that work to bring reconciliation where it can be, to bring healing where it's needed. Because only he can do that. Only he can bring true life. Take a moment. And within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Well, come to the altar. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Ladies, take it away.
Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Bow down before him. For oh, he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah. guys take your seats for me real quick. And again, I, I want to avail myself as I have over these last few weeks if anyone is struggling in an issue of within your marriage. I'm not perfect in mine. You can ask my wife. <laughs> but I'm here to help. Um, Amy's here. We, we are here as, as a couple to help you. And we can point you in directions if there's counseling that's needed. If you're struggling in an issue in your singleness, please come to me. Don't do this thing alone. Life is too hard to try to do alone, right? Uh, but at this time, and the reason I asked you to sit is we're going to have part two of our right hand of fellowship. So I'm going to ask the Rodriguez family to come on up and David as well. So you guys come on up so I can shake your hands. Come on, come on. All right, so. Helps to turn me on, okay. So if you remember last week, we had the first installment of our Right Hand of Fellowship for new members, and we had a full stage. Imagine had they all been here last week, too. Man, that stage would have been exploding. So we are so thankful for our new members and for what they mean to us. And, and you know, David's been here forever. And I think you thought you were a member but didn't really realize that he wasn't. So praise God for that. So David Studley, welcome to the family. Love you, brother. Awesome. And then if you remember when we did our baptism a few weeks ago, we saw the Rodriguez family get baptized. So we have Ethan... We have Penelope, we have Chris, we have Sarah, and we have Vladimir, not Vladimir, Vladimir, we love you, Vlad. Yeah. 
So praise God for them. Let's welcome to the family. Woo! All right, you guys, don't forget that Harvest Festival is Tuesday. Please come on out for that. Um, youth, if you're a high schooler, we're going to go to a crazy fun worship night tonight. So please come here at 5 p.m. We'll be back by 9. Um, we're going to grab dinner together. It's a wor- you're not going to want to miss. It's great worship. So if you want to come anyways, just come talk to me, and you can, I'll tell you where it is and come, worship night. Um, but Harvest Festival Tuesday, we'll see you then. God bless you. God bless you watching at home. We love you. We'll see you guys soon. Goodbye. Bye.